But anyway, moving on. We've got a bit of a loose agenda today. Um, so I'm going to be taking over the first half of this webinar. And then for the second half, I'll pass you over to Ollie. We're going to start with a bit of an introduction to SSE and um, security with Splunk. So I'll take you through a very quick overview. Um, we'll be going through some detection basics, finding content and actually identifying relevant content. Um, and then in the latter half, we're going to be looking at operate, 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 content, if I can speak, uh, managing custom content and then reporting and auditing with SSE. So what are our goals for today? Um, hopefully everyone finishes this webinar and has a really good understanding of what Security Essentials is and how it actually uh, can benefit you. Gain an understanding or a refresh if you're already somewhat familiar of the different parts of Security Essentials because it's for a free app, it's very big, it offers quite a lot. Uh, we want everyone to be able to identify what content is available in SSE and when it can be used and how it applies to your own personal data, the data that you've already brought into your Splunk deployment. And then finally learn a little bit about analytic stories, how they can be implemented, deployed, developed, tuned. So really a mixed bag. So first of all, I just want to kind of do a little bit of an explanation of what Security Essentials is. Um, in my opinion, it's kind of that bridging app between just core Splunk and enterprise security. Um, and if you're in a situation where you're using core Splunk or Splunk Enterprise for your security alerting or reporting um, and are struggling to you know, get the most out of your data or figure out what data you need to be bringing in, then Security Essentials kind of fills that gap and is there as that support. So what does it actually do? Um, as opposed to what's it for. So it's there to help with data onboarding, um, identifying what sort of data you need, um, what your data can already do, um, and then mapping that against specific frameworks. Um, specifically, the, the most common one we use is the MITRE ATT&CK framework. Um, so that's all baked into SSE, and it's ultimately there to get you a faster time to value um, with your security content, with your security data that you're bringing in. So it is, um, well, to provide a little bit more context around the SSE app, um, which is the Splunk Security Essentials app, uh, it's the most used app across all Splunk environments, with it being the starting point or kind of that middle ground, um, early middle ground really, for most Splunk security journeys. Part of the reason for its popularity is that it comes pre-built with tons of content. Um, SSE keep, calls each of these bigger use cases uh, an analytic story, of which it comes with more than 900 out of the box. Um, so kind of it's, it's as close as you can get to plug and play um, in the security stack, in my opinion. Of course, this does seem like a ton of content to sift through. But you also have sorting and filtering uh, tools and options to only display the content that's relevant to you. So it's incredibly quick and easy to use. SSE is trusted by loads of different organizations uh, and has found like wild success in businesses of all sizes and all shapes. And it's fundamentally applicable and usable in any Splunk environment. If you're already bringing in data that is relevant to security or you want to bring in data that's relevant to security, then SSE is an obvious choice. There's literally no negative to it with it being completely free. So the four pillars uh, in which SSE actually helps to bring that uh, value to users. This is split into these four areas, finding content, learning Splunk security, improving production, and then measuring your own successes. So the first pillar being the finding of content. So this includes those analytic stories that I briefly mentioned. Uh, again, picking just loads of random stories. Sure, there's 900 available. Let's just turn on all 900. That's not a very efficient or security-wise uh, approach of getting the most out of this content. So SSE has a ton of dashboards dedicated to showing which areas are covered by those stories that you've already implemented and where there's room for improvement. And that kind of slots into that third pillar of improving production 
it gives you that um, analysis and detection coverage of what you're doing and where you could improve. SSE is really, really good when it comes to learning Splunk security. And to be fair, just learning Splunk fund fundamentals um, is also highly beneficial in. Uh, each use case has a entire dashboard page dedicated to it, where it's going to explain to you why do you need this use case, where can it be used, how do you implement it, um, what are the sort of things, uh, remediations that you would include if this specific use case actually triggered, if this specific search actually triggered. And then it also provides you uh, the SPL, where most of the use cases, I don't think it's quite all, have a line by line documentation explaining exactly what the search does. So it can be really good if you're wanting to just learn a bit more SPL or you're trying to implement some maybe more complex use cases that you're not really sure where to start. It provides that SPL for you, which can then be copied and tweaked and changed to kind of completely suit your um, ecosystem. And then finally, we've got the measuring of success. Um, you have tools with SSE to report and monitor on your actual security journey as opposed to just alerting and, and tracking your searches. Um, so you can map your content, you can see where it applies, um, which is really beneficial when you need to uh, address specific concerns to decision makers. If you've got tons of really good data, but actually one kind of key tactic or technique is being missed, um, SSE will automatically identify that for you so that you can then export that and go, here you go, here's what we're doing well in, here's where we need improvement, can we please get this data into our deployment as well? So the security content development, this is a more of a fundamental slide, but uh, content development is one of the most crucial capabilities for security. But there's a lot of problems uh, that people can typically encounter when trying to develop security content. So first of all, it takes time. Um, it's not as simple as, here's all my data. Now we know where we're going wrong. We know where our alerts are. It's not that simple, unfortunately. It's also a formal process. Um, anything that wants to be implemented is going to have to be planned. You're going to have to have like a, a clear um, formula of how you're actually going to implement any use cases. To complement that, it takes a lot of research. You're not just going to decide, ah, yes, pick 10 random use cases out of a hat. Those are the ones we need. Each individual system is going to need, or network or business, is going to have its own specific requirements or own specific use cases that are more or less beneficial. So there's a lot of research that goes in before you actually even start implementing any of these. Once you've got a list of things, uh, use cases that you do want to implement, uh, prioritization comes in. So sure, we've got 20 use cases. These are what we want to be alerting on. Okay, now we need to start considering which do we prioritize, which is most important, and which do we need to be um, focusing our attention on. And then we've got the actual implementation. This is where you get your searches in, in Splunk's case at least. Uh, you get your searches in, you set up your alerts, you tune, you um, maintain, you tweak, um, which is funnily enough where maintenance comes in as well. Just because we've got all these searches set up, it doesn't mean they're perfect. We might be in a case where one specific alert is triggering way too often, um, maybe with tons of false positives. You're going to have to go back and address that. You're going to have to maintain and uh, tune those searches to make sure that you are providing the most efficient um, security resources. So this is where SSE comes in, SSE to the rescue. SSE is super useful when you're trying to develop your security maturity. So in addition to like common security challenges, it's not uncommon to find the different parts of an organization or uh, different stages of the security maturity journey, which is a bit of a mouthful. This makes it difficult for security teams to know where to start. Um, so again, SSE is there um, so that you can use your data that's already being collected and analyzed in Splunk to then strengthen security strategy. 
So next, I'm going to go over some of SSE's key pre-built dashboards, um, and we'll jump into a bit of a, more of a live demo instead of just going through a PowerPoint. Um, I will go through a slide on each just beforehand, uh, and then I'll actually show you. So first, we've got the data and content introspection dashboards. This is where you track your data um, and your searches and really quickly identify what data you've got in, um, what data you've got normalized within your Splunk installation. It's all automatic, so you can just run a scan um, and do an automated introspection scan so that all of your data can be mapped to each of these different um, data models, data sets, types of data. Uh, and then, yeah, they can be further scaled with data model acceleration or by reinforcing uh, Kim compliance, but that's kind of out of the scope of this workshop. But anyway, if I move across, I should have somewhere. Desktop three, that's why. Let's move that across, it'll be much smoother. I should have a login, which I'm going to have to find the password to, seeing as it's expired. Um, a login to a demo box. So this is all fake data, if there is any in it. I haven't double checked. Um, let me use the other account. And the password. Sorry guys, I appreciate your patience here. There we go. So I've just logged into our test box. Uh, our demo box, and I will be navigating to our Splunk Security Essentials app. And when we work, when we first initially load um, SSE, you get this uh, home dashboard, which is basically here for you to navigate to pretty much any part of SSE. If you click on any of these, you have the ability to drill down and find out exactly what you need. But for now, I'm going to be looking at the data inventory overview and the data inventory dashboards. So the data inventory overview, and I'm not sure that it's going to populate because this won't have any data in it. This is where you can see um, the different data sources that you are currently ingesting, uh, specific products, specific data source categories, to really get like a high level overview of what your data is showing and what it can be used for. If I move to the actual data inventory, once it loads, this is where you can complete and start your um, introspection. We won't go through it today. It will always ask you this on your first, uh, first go through it, but we won't go through it today. But this is where um, all of your data is mapped. You can see there's tons of different categories here. If I were to break any of them down, you can see that authentication has seven different Kind of source types so successful uh, authentications it maps all of the mitre attack tactics and techniques to this specific um, data source it gives you tons of information on what this sort of data is the different content that's available for it specific data onboarding guides for um, really common source types um, which will which will vary depending on what you're looking at. Um, so if I looked at proxy requests, for instance, you can see we've got Zscaler and Palo Alto. And it's really here that you, you would typically run an automated introspection and then say if we had these web proxy logs, this would become populated. And there we go. Now we know that we can um, look into this content and this could be relevant to us and we have the data that's available for it. Moving on, we have got the uh, security framework dashboard. So the MITRE ATT&CK framework dashboard is a really big one. Uh, this is where you can identify those gaps uh, in your data or in the use cases that you've activated and set up and kind of figure out where you've got gaps in your alerting and your searching. Um, it also has the ability for you to find specific detections for specific threat groups or threat softwares. And again, is really there for a tool for you to be able to use to see how good your data is at covering specific uh, techniques and tactics. So if I move back along, 
we should in, here we go, analytics advisor, look at the MITRE ATT&CK framework dashboard. And again, it's probably going to look rather upset on this test box. And the matrix will eventually populate. So this at the moment is just showing the content that's available, um, the total content that's available uh, just in enterprise, so not in enterprise security. And you can see that with SSC, we suddenly have tons of availability for loads of different um, techniques and tactics within the MITRE framework. And you can see that if I went to main trust discovery, um, you can see that we have 11 total bits of content, all all of them need data at the moment and that's because we don't have any data in here but it's also going to track the active the available needing data by default but you could change that and filter down to only show um, maybe the use cases and the content that you have the data for so that you can immediately go okay we've got tons of data available for brute force maybe we don't have any brute force detection set up Luckily, we've got the data there, so we are all good. And then you can think about identifying specific use cases and then developing them, tweaking them to suit your needs. I appreciate that this is a very quick tool, but um, I think we're going to be going a little bit more in detail in the second half. Next, we have the security content library, which is the real meat of um, SSE. This is where you get your use cases, you get your searches. Um, and you get the real value out of SSE. This is what it's all about, really. So it's just a really big library of tons of different um, searches and analytic stories that are there for very specific use cases. Some of them are a little bit more broader, depending on what they're trying to cover. But if I move back and go under content and security content, we can get a massive, massive list of everything SSE offers. And this will take a second to load again. But once we're here, you can see that we've already got 17, almost 1800 different um, bits of security content. You can see that as part of our security journey, which I'll show in just a second, so I think it's very beneficial. Um, we are just looking at this very first stage. So this is in, um, once you've just started to get your data in, really, these use cases become available to you. And if I, for now, just very quickly open one up, like this basic malware outbreak, and this will take a second to load as well, and I won't go in detail here, um, but this will show the, the who, the what, the where, the when, the how of how to implement this. Um, you can see, again, all of the MITRE attack tactics and techniques are mapped to this specific use case. Um, the specific threat groups, kill chain phases, and the data sources that you're going to need. On the left, we've got a bit more context around the actual uh, search and the use case. So the use case is just some generic security monitoring under the endpoint compromise category. And if I can scroll down, you can see that we have got um, a super basic search for this, again, very basic uh, use case. But even with these more basic ones, it's not that they're, um, they shouldn't be used or you know they're not gonna do a good job. It might just be that they require a little bit of tweaking to make um, particularly valuable and efficient. As you can see, it's not particularly using uh, Splunk SPL best practices, index equals star, for instance, is a super inefficient way to search, but it's there to get the real meat of it. And then on top of that, for a lot of these, you have a line by line SPL documentation. So you can see on this first line, we are getting our data, basically setting a um, time range and we're identifying where to look. This second one, we are looking for grouping events uh, and we're using transaction because it's super easy to use. And then finally, we've got a where clause where the move count of specific computer name is greater than three. 
but that's available for I want to say 95% of security content in SSE. Um, so when you start looking at those super complicated use cases, um, that same breakdown is still available to you. And finally, I just want to briefly touch on the security data journey um, because it's super important when trying to mature and develop your Splunk security. It basically boils down from day one, you've just bought Splunk, you've just started using Splunk, um, you want to get some security data in, all the way into the point where you are super advanced, super mature, you've got things like RBA, you've integrated SOAR playbooks, um, and every step in between. So as you can see, as we work up the um, security data journey, more and more content is available to us. And that's just because we've got um, things like normalized data, um, we've got more data coming in, we've enriched our data, um, and then again, we start getting towards automation and orchestration towards the top. For each of the categories, you can see specific data sources that are likely to be beneficial for this um, specific stage. And I just want to make a note that it's super important um, to follow the stages. Um, you couldn't say go from collection straight to enrichment because a lot of the use cases that you'll use, even if it was in stage four, are going to rely on the configuration that you've set up in each of the previous stages. But this is really useful to use to kind of see the bigger picture and like the journey that you will be going on with SSE and with the Splunk security stack. But anyway, I will move on. So yeah, SSE is ultimately the place to go for security content. So it provides views and management of all security content. So that comes from um, Splunk threat search teams. So Splunk has a dedicated team that are updating that security content regularly and uh, ensuring that all uh, relevant data or relevant security content is available. So if a new um, type of attack is discovered uh, in a week's time, for instance, I would be very surprised if a new analytic story or new piece of security content isn't then available. There's also enterprise security content. So SSE isn't specific to core Splunk, Splunk Enterprise. There's UBA content um, and some SOAR playbooks. It can be used um, in, it just sits in any Splunk security stack, regardless of the maturity. So again, if you're that day one system, um, you've just thought about getting Splunk, uh, security data into Splunk, SSE is valuable. If you're in those top levels of that security data, of that data journey, then SSE is still beneficial. It's constantly updated. There's a lot of um, resources being put into SSE, which is brilliant because, again, it's a free app. You don't lose anything from bringing it into your system. So a little note on MITRE because Ollie's going to go a little bit more in depth um, in this second half. So um, MITRE, is it related to you? Is it useful? Um, ultimately, yes, is my slightly biased opinion. MITRE is massive, it's recognized across industry, uh, and it's used specifically in SSE to make sure that you're prioritizing what's important to your organization. Uh, the same threats that are present in your sector might not be as prevalent in a different one. So. For instance, the, real the retail sector might have um, a lot more PCI um, threats when compared to something like the transport sector, for instance. So therefore, it's really relevant to initially prioritize implementing alerts and reports that's focused on what's relevant to you. And that's what MITRE is used for with SSE.
So MITRE in security essentials, it's there for quite a lot. It fits into SSE by enriching uh, content with clear tags and groups, as we saw um, in that, what was it? It was like a basic malware alert, um, which allows those of similar topics to be grouped together. So that avoids depending on whether a specific technique needs more development to actually secure your system or to be avoided on to focus on techniques that you are not currently alerting on. You'll notice enterprise security pops up in a lot of, um, or at least a good chunk of content. And that's where tags and these MITRE tags really come in to shine. But I won't particularly go into that in detail um, because that's kind of something that more fits into the scope of our third workshop on ES and RBA. So MITRE attack coverage, um, this is exactly what I was just showing in that uh, previous dashboard, but a little bit different. You can see what techniques you have or don't have coverage for, and then drill down on each of those specific techniques um, to see specific detections that are relevant to them. You can have them annotated with threat groups that target you, or filter for techniques popular with many different groups. And then if you're considering a new data source, which is where I think it really shines, uh, if you are thinking of bringing a new data source in, you can then have the techniques that, um, that are supported by that data source already highlighted. So if you are thinking about bringing in like a specific firewall log, you could then map that onto this matrix and see what content that opens up for you. So let's begin this is a little bit more um, into the setup of SSE and less about just going through a couple of different um, dashboards when you first start and integrate SSE that data inventory which I very briefly looked over is kind of your starting point without having that data inventory and introspection scan set up SSE isn't going to know what content is relevant to you um, what data you have available. So it's super important to get it done and get it done right. There's six steps when it comes to uh, the data inventory. First of all, you're gonna have to be looking at preparation. Um, this is a set, this is all done automatically, sorry. So this is when you hit that button, this is what it does, that automated in introspection scan. It starts off by pulling indexes, sources, and source types, um, and can use TSTATs if you have um, accelerated data models set up. Then it looks into uh, KIM or SIM searches, which is going to be looking at whether your um, data is KIM compliant and normalized. And then it's gonna run source type based searches. So it's gonna go against all of those different source types from that big long list on the left on that dashboard. Then it's going to re review the SIM-based results. So it lists out, lists out, sorry, all of the source types found in data models, which would then make them uh, can comply. And then we'll ask you to select which product they refer to, um, which could be multiple. You might have multiple different products for the same source type or for similar source types. Um, it's an optional step because it kind of as well it's completely based on whether you're looking at sim compliance and um, whether you're at that level in your maturity yet finally in the last two kind of points we've got the uh, kim and event size introspection um, and the event volume and host volume introspection so looking at data volumes so non-standard data will it work um, maybe you've got your own custom logs uh, can you implement them and get them to map to different security content? Uh, well, yes, you can. It's just important to make it KIM compliant. It needs to be normalized. Um, so SSE contains a lookup, which is going to have tons of common source types, which is what was populating on that screen that we just saw. Um, if there's source types that aren't found on the list, it's not going. Um, 
it's not going to work unless you have that SIM compliance and your data is normalized. So with your custom source types, if you want to integrate them with SSE, it's just super important to get um, into making sure that it's normalized and can comply. I won't go into normalization too much because again, a little bit out of the scope of this call, of this webinar. Um, you can also manually integrate them. So uh, if you have data that isn't KIM compliant and it's not in the list of common source types, you can manually add the data sources. Um, but again, the simplest and the easiest way is trying to work towards that normalization. Um, I can't stress it enough. So where is it stored? I won't bother showing this off in the um, actual uh, box because it's just a couple of lookup files. Uh, there's two lookup files. You've got the data inventory event types and the data inventory products. Uh, you can view these if you want to uh, in search or just in the lookup editor app if you have it. Uh, if accessing from search, you're going to have to append underscore lookup to the end of the KB store collection name. So as it shows on the screen, data underscore inventory underscore event types underscore lookup. Again, I won't bother doing this because A, I'm not sure that we have the um, lookup editor app and B, we don't have anything in these lookups because we don't have the data. So verifying your data, this uh, kind of fits in with your Kim compliance and normalization. This uh, is available in SSE. There's also another app out there that is purely focused on checking for Kim compliance. Um, and particularly works a little bit better. It's another free app, so there's no, no reason why you can't have that one installed as well. Um, but there is the option to check your data and see if it is Kim compliant against all of the standard data models and data sets. Cool, next we're moving on to content mapping. So what is content mapping? Um, it's a guide to make it easier for you to mark detections, searches uh, that you already have. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, when looking in, when looking, sorry, for like pre-built content in SSD, um, it's typically quite good to think about content mapping because you are already having you don't want any duplicated content. If you've already got those base searches in and you're at the stage where you're looking for additional value, it's really important to make sure that there's no redundancy between your searches. You don't need to be looking for the same brute force attempts across two different searches because that's going to eat into your resources. It's going to eat into your um, CPU and it will affect the actual um, the speed of your system, you're going to eat away at your resources. So it searches uh, your environment, but, sorry, it searches in your environment for matches of following criteria and will automatically be imported into SSE as custom content. So you can still have all of your content in SSE that you've built yourself. It's not just isolated and kept somewhere separate. So the search is a correlation search, which is important to note because correlation searches are ES specific. So your custom content might have to come from ES. Um, it'll only look for searches that are enabled. If it's disabled, they are just flat out ignored. And it will also um, ignore all that are already mapped to content from direct match. So if it was a search that you copied from SSE, it's not going to then import it back as custom content. Um, any detection that is mapped will be highlighted with the uh, little chain SSE symbol that you can see on the right. And the results of the uh, content introspection are stored in the bookmark and local search map mappings KV store lookups. So yeah, content introspection will try to map your active searches to SSE content. 
Um, here you will see like saved searches that are not related to detections. Part of this wizard is to identify which active uh, saved searches are found, which SSE content uh, they are mapped to, and finally, if the recommendations of the engine are correct. You have to go through the um, entries in the list and make sure that the right option is selected. So it is a little bit of a manual process. Uh, and as an example, you could select the Splunk Wrap Diagap um, if you are looking for a specific app uh, in all of these different drop down menus that you can see along the top. Cool content discovery. Um, I can show this on off a little bit. This is just filtering down for um, content that is relevant to you. So it could be if I move back and go into security content. Once it loads, because again, we've got almost 1800 bits of content, that's going to take a lot of time to sift through. The biggest one, in my opinion, is looking at the stages of the journey. If you're following that data journey, you're going to have a really good idea of where you're at. So, for instance, if I keep it on stage one collection, you can see that most of them fit into expansion, um, which is after all your data has been normalized and you've started to get all of the relevant data in. But if we just look at stage one for now, you can see that we've got 87 matches. Stage one is typically where um, just Splunk Enterprise uh, environments will sit because normalization in the use of data models comes inherently with ES. You can see that we've got tons of different categories. So maybe we're looking at ransomware. Um, you can select for specific analytic stories, which might not be relevant to ransomware. Um, and just another quick reminder that an analytic story is basically uh, a bunch of different searches that fit around the same use case. And then you can search for specific data sources. But on top of that, you can include all of these different um, filters. So a good one is data availability. I won't do it in this case because we don't have any. Uh, but I could include it to show the searches that uh, only show bits of content where the searches are included, and you can see that we've still got all eight. And again, here I could click on any of these. Another good point to uh, look at is these featured ones. Um, featured bits of content are highly recommended by Splunk security team. So they might be particularly relevant at the moment. They might be attacks or um, malware that is like particularly prevalent at the moment. But yeah, ES fully empowers you to only see the, the content that is relevant to you instead of getting bogged down by, again, 1800 bits of content. So again, that's just building more. You can uh, choose data availability, um, just show the searches that are available to you based on the data that you've already brought in and mapped to um, each of those different data sources in that introspection scan. And furthermore, here's another example where they are choosing a specific originating app. And I think finally looking through specific attack tactics, mitre attack tactics. But yeah, sorry for uh, rushing through those last few slides. I'm just very conscious of the time. Uh, I'm now going to pass you over to Ollie, who is going to start off by talking about content integration. Um, and you should be able to just take over the screen, I think, Ollie. Yeah, got it. Cheers, Jay. Uh, so now that we've covered where you would find relevant content within Security Essentials, I'm going to cover how you would uh, maybe go about integrating that content uh, and using it to enhance your, your Splunk security. It'll be rehashing a little bit of what Jake said, but I, I think whenever I get to a section that Jake's kind of covered, I'll just end up skipping past it. Uh, and yeah, we'll try and focus on some of the uh, example use cases which Splunk used to show you. So if I go to the next slide, we can see straight in with the uh, the content integration. Again, this is back on that uh, that slide that Jake was showing before. But we're actually going to dive into one of these searches. So for this section, I think it's probably best just to jump across to the box here. 
as you can see, I'm just in the home screen for Splunk Security Essentials. I'm going to go content and then security content. And it's just going to bring up that, uh, that slide Jake was showing off with all the uh, security content available and the, the stories available. So when looking for the pre-built content at Security Essentials, we go into the security content, we find the content that we're interested in. Uh, and then we can enable, easily enable this content from there. We, uh, we're going to look for this example at stage three. But I mean, at any stage, as Jake said, there's plenty of searches, most of which are documented. Uh, I'm going to go into stage three just because it, it offers us quite a uh, quite a thorough uh, bit of content for us to look at. Apologies, the box seems to be being quite slow. Uh, so when it decides to load, I will click here. Uh, and we're going to look at AWS abnormally high AWS instances which could be indicative of a, maybe a DNS attack being launched from your from your area or an attacker taking your AWS cloud accounts and using that for some sort of malicious uh, malicious reason. So yeah, uh, as I said, this is under the third stage of the content library, the expansion stage. You find that uh, a lot of security content is in that expansion stage once the SSE is completely set up. And maybe if you want to look at start to integrating ES, but even not, stage three, you kind of get to when SSE is fully set up. So as we can see, when we click into a, uh, a piece of security content in Splunk Security Essentials, we're presented by a screen that initially gives us the option to clone this into custom content and take this search and change it as we see fit as well as uh, some more information around it, including the, uh, how to implement it, what analytical stories it relates to. So if you saw this search and thought, yeah, that's useful, I wanna maybe implement more searches around that and uh, catch a lot of the AWS uh, instances or the AWS activities, which could indicate uh, malicious entities and malicious attacks. And you can look into the analytical stories. Again, a lot more information, a lot of the tags. We go down further into this page and it tells us the prereqs that are needed for this search. So you need a macro cloud trail uh, and AWS cloud trail data, the main ones. So there you go. You know if you have this in your environment, uh, for this test environment, AWS cloud trail, AWS cloud trail data is, a, is there. So we can see it's ticked in status. Uh, and then if I go into, uh, if I look at this search, I can then see here that it is, uh, the whole search given to is given to us a on this one it's not giving us a breakdown of the search itself however if i was to go into uh if i was to go into other other searches as i was to go now if it was to go to, into other security content i'll go into a stage one one so i can just quickly show you the uh the search breakdown that's given to you but that's just an example of the search that like you search you might want to integrate into your security environment based on a based on a theme that you yourself have found But I will go into a, a stage one piece of content and I'll just run through that and I'll show you how Splunk breaks down the uh, the search for you. So we'll just use a basic brute force detection as the uh, as the example given here. Also note bookmarking searches within Splunk Security Essentials is, is highly recommended. It allows you to easily find the ones that you have decided to integrate. In a, well, also when you go to bookmark a search, once the search is bookmarked, you then access all your bookmark searches uh, and then basically document how far you've got on integrating them, how much data you've got on for them. So all of your security analysts can understand at what stage you're at. As we see here on this search, we have the line by line SPL documentation. So for this brute force search, for every line of SPL that's written by Splunk, it tells us what is going on. So here it tells us what data sets are bringing in and why we use the stats and eval commands. And then also what this filter does, what that also goes to do is teach you how security searches are built. Uh, alongside that, it also, if you wanted to edit this search, gives you more of an idea of where you'd want to edit. For instance, if you were highly conscious that brute force attacks are, are quite rare and like even 10 failures would probably indicate a brute force attack because all of your security personnel, all the people logging onto your instance are highly well trained. They don't ever get their password wrong more than two or three times. We would say maybe cut that number down to 10 and then that's highly indicative that a brute force attack is going on. But anyway, that's uh, that's basically how you would go about integrating your content. You take this search, you would then 
uh, you would then save it as an alert or a report, or you could even uh, clone the content into custom content and set that custom content for reporting within Splunk Security Essentials. Moving on in ES, you could then build correlation searches around it and investigations. So yeah, this is just uh, this slide. These slides are just showing you what I was talking about there. Uh, and as Jake said earlier, I'm going to go a bit more into the Mitre Attack Analytics Advisor. Looking at looking at the framework, Mitre Attack Framework is an example, but in Analytics Advisor, there's also the Cyber Kill Chain. Uh, so yeah, just to make sure you guys are familiar with Mitre Attack. So essentially, the Mitre Attack Framework is a massive database or knowledge base which encompasses an incredibly vast amount of cyber attacks and information on them, including how they're carried out what the telltale signs of them occurring are, and what the repercussions of them are the best way to defend against them are. The content in them is constantly being updated, as Jake said earlier, makes it an ideal repository for drawing on in security hubs like SSE, and also ES as well, although we are focusing on SSE today. The data itself is gathered and uh, updated through multiple means, the most prevalent of those being publicly available threat intelligence and incident reporting, as well as by research on new techniques contributed by cybersecurity analysts and threat hunters. Uh, so we currently have gone through uh, essentially step by step how you guys would utilize SSE and how the uh, the different functionality of it works. You, you would onboard and gain knowledge on how data is handled and then looked at detection through content integration, as I've just covered. So the next step uh, would be, as Slump puts it, that's operationalizing with MITRE ATT&CK. Uh, and that's where this stage comes in. So what does that actually mean? Well, in practical terms, there is a big section of SSE which uh, utilizes and gives you massive insights into the MITRE ATT&CK kill chain, uh, the MITRE ATT&CK framework, sorry, in the cyber kill chain. Uh, as I said, we'll use MITRE ATT&CK as an example here today. So uh, I'll just show you first hand. That's probably the best way to see what value you can get. So you go into that tab in SSE uh, and you're immediately greeted once this populates by that big chart that Jake showed you earlier. I won't go too far into it as Jake has already covered it, but the general idea is you sort by the content which you want to see. A lot of the time, you'd want content available. That's content in the MITRE ATT&CK matrix that is available for you. You have data on, and then you can act on it. As you can see, nothing's highlighted currently. That's because this in this environment, the data inventory mapping hasn't been done. However, if your data inventory mapping had been done, you would have a lot of highlighted searches. As we scroll down, we can see a lot more information basically based on the content we've selected. So there's 1,649 entries in the Mitre ATT&CK framework that have been selected, uh, which apps are they are covered by, so which apps you'd need uh, and integrate with them. As you can see, it's kind of a, a pretty even split for all of it uh, with security content update and security, and security essentials making up around 25% each, which are the two main security supplemental apps that you'd get when you're integrating security content. Uh, and also you can look at your bookmark content. However, uh, I think I'll call it there for MITRE ATT&CK, just being conscious of time. And I feel like that's a, that's, a, that's a good way to go. In fact, we can talk about this radar view really quickly, actually. So if we use one of the tabs here, we can then look at the radar view, which would bring up something like this once it's loaded. Uh, and basically what that says is there's a, basically what's that going to show is there's quite a few other panels within the MITRE ATT&CK framework, which would show you more information but also uh, give you more of a more of a visual, which will then allow you to, oh, it's, it's not loaded for some reason, so I'll just talk over this slide. So it basically, if you were to show this to a manager, the idea is that these dashboards and outputs that are coming out from Monitor Attack give you, the, uh, give you the capabilities to show this to a manager or someone who is in charge of maybe got a data onboarding uh, and show them where the data you need to get in relates to real world attacks and how you could actually justify these data sources. Moving on from that, if you went to the Sankey view, it would give you another another overarching view of what data that you want that you want in. So uh, as a SOC, you have your own strategy to or what use cases you want to implement. Uh, and then you could use that to uh, be able to provide wide coverage for some specific tax ages. Using that analytics advisor, you can see what your current capabilities are and where you need that data to justify, as I was just talking about. Uh, and then that goes to operationalizing uh, MITRE. You can also group on threat groups. For instance, if, you're com if your company is in the industry of the financial industry, you could look at where your content's available for the financial industry uh, and then look where, oh, apologies, 
and then look where the different sections of MITRE are most relevant for here. It would be defensive evasion and discovery. Uh, again, this is looking at maybe you want to look at a specific threat group that you know is actually causing an issue and look at their attack techniques and where that relates to your environment. You can also change the MITRE threat group to, to relate to that. Moving on, the next part of SSE we'll talk about is the custom content stuff which you can do. I know, uh, I know this is quite a uh, hot topic for a lot of people. A lot of companies which are looking to integrate security content into their Splunk because uh, at the end of the day, not everything out of the box is going to be completely relevant. Everyone has their own bespoke use cases. With SSE, there comes the ability to create your own custom security content, which I'm going to go through on these slides. The, this slide is showing you how you would initially go about creating your own content. That is under security content, you click on custom content. Uh, I'll go through and I can start it loading now and it can take a few seconds to load. So if I start that loading now, I'll go through the next slide. Obviously when uh, you create your own content, there's the need then to create your own SPL. The examples given uh, by Splunk is SPL to detect password spraying, which is a type of brute force attack, which involves a malicious actor attempting to use the same password on multiple accounts before moving on to try another one. Uh, this search given here is accelerated with tstats. However, if you weren't using ES, you could still in integrate this search and uh, define the indexes you want to search. But however, as there is no uh, there's no tagging and accelerated data, it, the search wouldn't be as effective. Once you've built that uh, security content, you enable the security content. Uh, as we can see here, you would click Add Custom Content. Uh, you would then create your you would then create a, a search uh, what fields are involved with that content and basically go through this whole thing you could tag the content and give it categories and essentially make it as easy as possible for other people who want to use this content to, like in a sock perhaps to go through and then use this content to alert on what's happening in your environment you can there uh, as I, I just showed that off the uh, the creating custom content and then once that once that custom con, once the custom content is then created, it's then integrated into SSE with a slightly different out with a slightly different uh, icon. You would also choose the stage and the tags associated with it. Uh, you could you're basically making entries in the content section of Security Essentials. The final part we're going to touch on today is reporting and custom commands. Uh, there's a huge amount of reporting and custom commands you can do in SSE. And it takes a lot of practice to get used to it to be fair so we'll talk about reporting first so we have some examples here the way you could report and the use case of reporting like justifying new data sources through the data source coverage reports uh or like that's kind of what i was talking about earlier showing your bosses and managers what data you think they should get in you can also export reports in excel or in excel or pdfs for auditors uh you've got proof of concept status reports which again could be used to show managers the value obtained from proposed new features or software uh, and data source coverage and security journey reports also, which can be used to report on the data environment and how thorough it is. Uh, and then there's also reports which you made in the MitoStack framework, exporting that big spreadsheet. Uh, as a very, very splunk, a very splunk slide there. Make all of us happy with Excel or PDF reports or your enable content. Uh, it, it poses a good point. If you have an auditor coming in and you want to just show them where your security coverage lies, report exporting one of these reports could be a really good way of doing that. I mean, they probably still want to dive into it, but if you can give them a good overarching view of what's going on, then uh, that's pretty perfect. Uh, yeah, so this is just going through more on how you'd go about content exporting. You'd go through the measure section of the home screen uh, and document your deployed content. That's deploying, that's looking at what content you have deployed. Uh, and I mean, content you have available and deployed and making a report on that. And in the same vein, you can generate reports on all the data in the analytics advisor. There's also the option to report on the security journey, uh, as Jake previously touched on. So how much you've fulfilled each stage of the previous of the security journey. Also, as previously mentioned, there's the ability to report based on the dashboards in the micro attack section of the analytics advisor. That includes the Sankey section, basically any section of the micro attack framework. You can uh, generate a report on and show that to people. Uh, and then finally, we're going to look at uh, SSE commands. There are some pre-built commands that is probably worth mentioning for SSE, which let you make your own dashboard data based on data you're looking at. Uh, all of them can be found at that following link there. The documents are really good for it. However, the the, the cool few ones that are, are highlighted by Splunk, Splunk sorry, are the SSE analytics, which provides a tabular output of SSE content, SSE identity enrichment, which is a lookup for products, MITRE IDs, data source IDs, 
basically any relevant IDs in your environment using that enrichment uh, command, you can bring them up. And then also MITRE map lookup, which ingests a set of uh, events and generates a MITRE attack map based on those events, see where them events relate to MITRE. Before leaving you today, we'll just talk about some supplemental apps. I won't go into massive detail on them, but it's worth mentioning the InfoSec app, that's the first one, is a collection of comprehensive, extensible dashboards and alerts that focus on the most common security-oriented technology components within your typical corporate environment. You can use this app to investigate incidents, automate compliance tasks, and help protect your network, users, and intellectual property from external adversaries and malicious insider threats. You can also use the app to provide executive-level reporting metrics, trends, and summaries. Uh, and this app it can be used to assist in completing audits by mapping customizable reports to common compliance frameworks such as NIST, HIPAA, PCI, and ISO. Uh, yeah, it's basically your starter security pack, right? Uh, and then there's also the network monitoring app for Splunk. Basically, the network monitoring app for Splunk is what it sounds like. It's looking at uh, network data coming in, contains dashboards for analysis of network logs and data. It utilizes heavily that Splunk Sankey diagram that I showed off earlier is installed on search heads uh, only because that's where the because basically when your network data is coming in it's quite lightweight to, just to look at it and search on it and it's number 16 the firewall apps and 40 just basically showing that it's a popular app uh, and that's a wrap uh, i hope you like the image of the cat and you appreciate what you've learned here today we've learned what sse is learn how to set up sse find and create content based on need reporting and then a brief work on them brief word on them couple uh, of apps so thank you for watching. If you have any questions, be sure to uh, send them in to uh, info at or maybe our support desk. And I'll see you next time.